So this morning, I'm delighted to welcome Dr. Robert Faulkner, who's an Associate Professor in the Department of International Relations. Robert has actually had two books out this academic year, but today he will be talking about his most recent publication, Great Powers, Climate Change and Global Environmental Responsibilities, which is an edited volume that explores the response of great powers to the climate crisis and what their role and responsibility should be in the international fight against climate change. At the end of the talk, we should be able to take a few questions via the chat. And as time is tight, uh, if you do think of a question while Robert's talking, please do type it in. But uh, for now, I will hand over to Robert to get started. Thank you. Thanks so much, Louise. Fantastic initiative, this series. And um, thanks for everyone uh, for joining today. Um, I'm looking forward to having this session. Let me share my screen so that you can see my slides that I've prepared. Um, I don't always use slides, but in this case, I thought it would be useful to put some of the arguments of the book on paper. So here's the book, uh, came out last month, so it's pretty much hot off the press. And it deals with a couple of big questions in the study of global environmental politics, which I've listed here. The key question that uh, got us going, it's a collective effort by a, a number of scholars, is, is what does power inequality do to the search for global environmental solutions? How does power inequality between states affect outcomes? And that begged further questions in our project about what does it mean to be an environmental power? Uh, some states are more powerful than others, but in what ways? And do some of these environmental powers, do they count as great powers in the field of environmental politics? The way we talk about great powers in security and perhaps economic affairs. And these are actually important questions that have never been really dealt with systematically in the field of global environmental politics. So this book is in a way the first one to pull together different strands of research on this. And we also pushed our contributors to ask about whether great powers then take on great responsibilities in this field, special responsibilities that perhaps only great powers have to shoulder. And could this lead to a more formalized system of great power management for the environment? Those, so those are the, the guiding questions. Um, let me just show you what we did in the book. So we held a workshop at the Grantham Institute, which, which supported this project. And as you can see, we had a, a number of contributors on the left-hand side, several of them from the LSE as well, who looked at individual great powers in this field. Uh, so the usual suspects, the United States, China, European Union are there, but we also looked at emerging powers that perhaps should be categorized as great environmental powers. So that's Brazil and that's India. And we also looked at uh, Russia as perhaps a declining great power, which though still remains a powerful actor in the environmental field. And on the right hand side, you can see we also looked at some issue areas and institutions uh, and how they deal with power inequality. Uh, so one chapter in particular that's of interest here is the, the role of the UN Security Council and its emerging role around climate change. So, so that's the project. We, we worked through this collectively, went through several iterations of the individual papers and have, I think, come together now in this volume in a, in a pretty consistent and coherent way. So let me talk a little bit about what we are dealing with. Let me start perhaps with a an illustration of what we mean by power inequality and how it shapes uh, environmental politics. Some of you may remember back in 2009, the Copenhagen Conference of the Parties to the Climate Treaty was held, and it was meant to agree a new treaty, a post-Kyoto climate treaty, which was supposed to be legally binding and tough in terms of emission reduction targets that countries would sign up to. And this was at least a demand that the European Union had made. It was joined in that demand by a number of developing countries who felt that climate change is so serious that it needs a legally binding treaty with tough emission reduction targets. However, as it turned out, that there was no consensus to be found at, at the Copenhagen conference. And it, it was about to break down the conference when at last minute, the United States, represented by Barack Obama, pulled in a number of other uh, climate powers, uh, the so-called basic countries, that's Brazil, South Africa, India, and China, 
And they hammered out a non-binding accord, the so-called Copenhagen Accord, in which they agreed to work together in a more voluntary or voluntarist form to uh, strive for emission reductions, but not in a legally binding way as had been demanded. And this kind of saved the conference from total collapse. And it also more, most significantly paved the way for the Paris Agreement in 2015, which is based on the same principles that were negotiated. It's caused huge upset among other members of the UNFCCC, the Framework Convention, because this was a secretive deal negotiated on the sidelines, not very open, not transparent. And it seemed to many at the time that this was the beginning of new formation of climate geopolitics with the great powers coming together and negotiating before the rest of the world is basically asked to ratify what they've dealt with. And this has provoked a lot of interest and, and also anxiety about the new reality of, of global climate politics. So in the book, we, we took this as our starting point. We asked, who is an environmental power in this field? What are the basis for environmental power in international relations? And in, in all international relations debates on power, you, you always have to factor in two fundamental dimensions of power. Material power, that is uh, rooted in, for example, control over natural resources and ecological systems. It could also be rooted in just pure economic clout, the ability to shape global economic flows. And so on that basis, we can define certain countries as powerful in an environmental sense. They control forests, they control large industrial systems. But we should never forget that uh, environmental power is also socially determined. Environmental power has a social dimension in the sense that it needs to be recognized by others. Uh, so legitimacy plays into this. Is a country recognized as a legitimate power in this field? Uh, this is where we look at entrepreneurial leadership, uh, the ability to shape the social structures within which international ne negotiations take place. Um, we then also distinguish between two different uses of power in the environmental field. States usually exercise what we call negative environmental power. That is, they control either uh, environmental goods or they can uh, produce environmental bads, pollution, uh, or the protection of ecosystems. And so, in a sense, a, a country that can harm the environment in a significant and globally relevant way will therefore have a large amount of negative environmental power, which also translates then into veto power in the negotiations. We saw this in Copenhagen. But then there's also a positive environmental power use, one that is about uh, leading negotiations, bringing about cooperative solutions, promoting uh, industrial change, providing leadership in a more uh, general sense. And so the important thing to point out here is that environmental power as such is a neutral term. It's often used in the literature in a more positive sense. We, we think of environmental powers quite often as those that want to produce a sustainable solution to these global environmental problems. But that's not the only way in which environmental power plays out. More frequently, power will be uh, used in a negative sense as veto power, as blocking power. And that's exactly what happened with the, the basic countries and the United States uh, at Copenhagen. This then begs the question, are there perhaps some environmental powers that should be considered great powers in the environmental field? Now, admittedly, that's not a widely shared use of the term yet. Most great power discourses occur within the security realm. But I, I, I think, and, and the contributors to this book also agree, that this is an emerging usage that we need to take into account. What does it mean to be a great power in international relations and in the environmental field? Well, again, there's a material side to it. You need to have significant amount of power, military power, economic power, but also political power. And we would expect that power to be of use, not just in a local, but also in a regional or global reach. Where we can, for example, distinguish great powers depending on whether they are global or only regional great powers. But then there is, again, the social dimension to this notion of great power, because with the claim to be a great power comes also the claim to be recognized by other powers in international relations as a great power. It's not just material 
factors. It's also the special recognition that great powers uh, are given by others because they take on special duties, special responsibilities in the international system. So there's a, a, a very close connection between both the special rights that great powers claim, for example, the right to take decisions on behalf of other nations about international order, and the special duties that powers therefore accept in the pursuit of international order. And this means we can never be sure who are the great powers at any given point in time. There are important sectoral and spatial differences, and therefore there is no definitive list of great powers we can uh, establish. We need to look at actual social interactions between states. And if we now apply this to the environmental field, and this basically draws on the contributions of the book that individual uh, authors have made, we can identify at least two uh, global environmental powers that are truly great powers with a global impact, and that's the United States and China. What they do economically, politically, will have an impact on environmental outcomes in virtually all environmental issue areas, from climate change to biodiversity, to chemicals pollution, to air pollution. They're also wielding environmental power in a positive sense in that when the US and China cooperate and promote solutions, that will facilitate uh, certain outcomes. And we saw this in the run up to the Paris conference in 2015, a bilateral agreement between the US and China to work together on climate change facilitated the adoption of the Paris Agreement. And something similar happened recently in the run-up to the COP26 meeting in Glasgow. Yeah, so the US and China clearly have the, the widest environmental power to wield, and they certainly use it. Then there's the European Union, and the interesting case, because it, it has similarly wide environmental power given its economic footprint, and it is perhaps the more consistent environmental leader in this field. But some analysts and our contributors to this volume too have pointed out that there's still questions about just how much of an actor it is in this field. It seeks to be a uniform and unitary actor, but that's not always a given. But also its environmental power is paradoxically perhaps uh, falling as it is moving towards more sustainable forms of economic growth and economic activity. So a declining negative environmental power the declining harm that countries are doing undermines their power. And the EU, European Union now finds itself often in the position of a demandeur, uh, a power that asks for solution rather than provides them in climate negotiations. Uh, the Russia, uh, Russian case is an interesting one because Russia still retains a great deal of negative power. It controls vast amounts of fossil fuels coal and oil, vast amounts of forests and, and ecosystems, but has rarely played a positive role in the negotiations. And in a similar way, Brazil, India, Indonesia, and others from the emerging economies are now clearly rising in their environmental power, now playing a bigger role, though only with limited leadership across a range of issues. Japan, again, is an interesting case because it always is considered to be a large environmental power because of its huge ecological footprint. Its economy still uses up enormous amounts of resources, but it has over time retreated from the kind of environmental leadership it provided in the past. So we find that there are a number of great powers in the environmental field, but they are not agreed on what it takes to be a recognized great power. So the status of a great power is still ill-defined and, and not fully uh, accepted. There are, there are questions about the legitimacy of any such claim. The US and China have come closest to being the widely recognized and self-conscious great powers in this field. The EU has an aspiration to play that role, uh, but many other powers still struggle with this notion of playing a more responsible great power role in this field. So what can we say about these special responsibilities that great powers take on in international relations? And do they apply in the environmental field? Just a, perhaps a few words about how the international relations discipline views this idea. This is known as the system of great power management 
it's an, a kind of an informal institution that has existed at least since the 19th century when the concert of Europe was the, the dominant form of managing international order, uh, maintaining stability and peace. Yeah, the idea is quite simply that great powers uh, take on a kind of a collective management role for the international system. And this gives rise to a kind of a legitimate form of domination where the great powers act out of an ethic of responsibility, not just a, a national self-interest. So the raison d'état uh, becomes a raison de système. Uh, the great powers accept that they have to transcend their own national interest and act on behalf of the global collective good. And for that reason, they are given special rights. They come together in special forums and take on that role, but they may also therefore be asked to take on special responsibilities, peacekeeping operations uh, in the security field and in the environmental field, one would argue they should therefore take on special roles in reducing pollution and finding solutions. But as we show in the, in the uh, book, that has proved really difficult to establish in a more formal way. Because the existing environmental responsibilities that are created in various environmental treaties, they're mostly differentiated along north-south lines. Power inequality is as yet not the key criterion with which to distinguish different environmental responsibilities. So this means that industrialized countries still take on special responsibilities, but many emerging economies that are now in environmental terms much more powerful, more impactful, are still resisting these special responsibilities or struggling to come to terms with the demand that's being made for them to take on these special responsibilities. There is also a further complication when great powers accept special responsibilities, they often ask for special rights in exchange. So for example, in the security realm, the UN Security Council has a system that gives the five permanent members a veto power. Now, this is, could be seen as a special right that compensates for their special responsibilities in this field. But we don't have that in the environmental realm. In fact, we have a strictly multilateral system that doesn't recognize special decision-making powers for the great powers. And so the great power forums that have now been used to negotiate climate change, think of the G7, think of the G20 and, and the UN Security Council is moving in that direction too. They only act in an informal way. They have not been formally recognized alongside, say, the UNFCCC or the UN Environment Programme to, to become environmental forums in, a, in that sense. So there's an informal minilateralism at work, but it hasn't translated yet in a formal great power management system. And what's more, there are consistent legitimacy concerns surrounding any use of great power management in the environmental field. Developing countries in particular ask difficult questions about whether it would be right to move in that direction. So that leaves me with my last slide and the question of where is this going to go? Will, if the climate crisis uh, deepens, will this lead perhaps to an acceleration of demands for great power responsibility and great power management? If we find that the multilateral system that we've created doesn't produce the kind of solutions in, in the timely and effective way that we need, then could it be that great powers will be asked to take on greater management responsibilities? The key question here is, will these great powers actually accept a raison de système uh, for the global climate? Or will they simply switch to a nationalist response that looks after their own raison d'état in this area? There's one interesting development we should recognize here. Climate change is increasingly securitized, is increasingly seen by countries around the world as an imminent security threat that requires a securitized response. That does push climate issues and other environmental issues very much in the direction of great power management. It could, for example, mobilize a bigger role for the UN Security Council in this area. And there have been various efforts to establish such a role, but that, those efforts are incomplete that kind of securitization has not happened yet. It is therefore questionable 
as yet, whether great power management will ever be formally established. Uh, one reason for this is that quite simply, the existing environmental powers that we can now identify as great powers still act not as great powers, but as great irresponsibles, to use Hedley Bull's famous words. There is not yet a recognition among the great powers themselves that they should take on special responsibilities. The second reason why we are not moving in that direction yet is that the environmental threats that we face on so many fronts are not yet systemically significant to international society. Unlike, say, an imminent invasion in the Ukraine uh, region, uh, in, in, in the Eastern European region, um, uh, is not that that uh, military threat that is systemically significant is not yet uh, the same kind of threat is not yet identified on the environmental front. Climate change has not become that threat to international order, peace and stability that perhaps military threats are. And for that reason, we should conclude that great power management in that sense is not yet on the agenda. Let me stop there. Thank you very much for listening and I'm looking forward to your questions now. Thank you very much, Robert. So yes, if anyone has a question, please do pop it in the chat. Um, I'll start with one of my own while people are thinking, um, which is, do you think that personality plays as an important role in, in environmental great powers as, as it might do in other areas, personality of leaders? Yeah, that's an interesting question. Um, so I've talked about state in the abstract, of course, as, as actors, um, the way we, we think of uh, corporations, perhaps. They're, in that sense, they're corporate actors, but of course they're led by individuals. And it's, it's evident that, that as soon as we move into a more social understanding of states, their identities and how they relate to each other, uh, leaders make a big difference. Uh, a, a powerful state leader, say Xi Jinping, uh, can take China in, in a different direction if, if he wishes to. Um, um, Xi Jinping has cl recently claimed uh, climate change responsibility for, uh, for uh, China and a form of leadership and a future leader that succeeds, she could as well reject that. So there, there's scope for individual leaders to make a difference. Uh, we saw this in the United States. Donald Trump very much rejected any US responsibility in this field. Uh, his predecessor, Barack Obama, and now Joe Biden, of course, have taken a different stance on that. So I think there is that, that role for individual leadership within states. But of course, looking at this from a more historical and structural perspective in international relations, we need to recognize that states are also hemmed in. And these leaders are hemmed in, in a sense, they need domestic support for whatever they seek to achieve internationally. And on that front, um, the states behave much more like slow moving tankers than, than nimble ships that can be turned quickly. Great. Um, while we wait for any questions, or oh, here's one. Um, do you think securitization would be an overall benefit or produce its own knock-on problems? And if the latter, is there another factor which could lead to environmental issues being prioritized with fewer drawbacks? A uh, very good question. And, and thanks for that, because that gives me an opportunity to clarify that I'm not necessarily advocating rapid and, and full securitization of climate change. I think it's inevitable that we're getting into this discourse. The question is, of course, what kind of solutions would a securitized climate policy provide? In what ways would securitization give us better tools to deal with the climate crisis? And that's where I have some serious questions. So when we're talking about moving towards a net zero global economy, we're talking about uh, very fundamental structural changes to the way in which industrial capitalism is organized. We're talking about phasing out fossil fuels. And it's not clear that securitization can deal with those complex changes in energy systems, industrial systems, in transport infrastructure, in, in our urban infrastructure. So, so on that front, I have my doubts about securitization helping us. Where securitization does matter is in an international context. It does help to foster perhaps greater cooperation among great powers who may be able to recognize both their own responsibility, but also the urgency to act. It is also uh, popular in terms of mobilizing domestic support for 
climate action. So paradoxically, perhaps, climate securitization has so far mostly reinforced the sort of non-security type responses. It's seen as giving greater urgency to, to climate policy, but that doesn't mean that climate policy has to become securitized as such. Thank you. And I've been sent a question and there's another question which are both about smaller states. So one is, um, would there be a way to distribute power to cater to states that have little power but are affected most by climate change? And on the opposite side, someone's asking whether, um, whether you have a view on the argument of right to develop for countries like Brazil or India and how to incorporate sustainable climate change policies that understand that kind of power discrepancy. Yeah, interesting. So, so the question about sm uh, weaker states and what we do with them and whether they would be disadvantaged in, in this kind of great power scenario that I've talked about, I think that's clearly a key problem. So, so one of the proposals, if we say move to a more minilateral system, if for example, the UN Security Council were to play a bigger role in this area, would be to give uh, smaller uh, players, weaker states, a seat, perhaps a shared seat in those decision making bodies. So there are some creative solutions we can think of, whereby the great powers take on a greater management role, but their power is checked by having representation by those states that are more vulnerable to climate change, uh, so that their perspectives are not excluded. But there is, I think, a fundamental paradox, a dilemma in this area, which is that ultimately in international relations, uh, power matters more than perhaps in a more domestic context where you have the rule of law. And so for that reason, we still look to the great powers to provide frameworks for cooperation. Uh, weak powers have no choice but work with the existing power inequalities that exist. And for that reason, we need to be creative here and find these kind of solutions. Don't think we can lend power to weak states. That's not how it works, but we can try and ensure that they have voice in the system. And then there's the, the question about um, emerging powers and, um, sorry, it was about whether um, sustainable development needs to change. Yes, the right to develop for countries like Brazil and India and how they incorporate sustainable climate change policies. Yep, I, thanks for that. That really goes to the, the, the dilemma that these countries face, the emerging powers, in terms of both wanting to still be seen as developing economies that have a lot of development still to accomplish, and yet their ecological footprint is already so huge that they have no choice but take on greater environmental responsibilities already. So countries like India are struggling with this and are resisting demands for greater responsibility. India presents itself as a developing country in the climate negotiations, hoping to get exemptions from certain demands for emission reductions because it is so far behind in terms of its emissions profile and developmental status and that creates friction and and internal strife within these countries um, it's clear that this can only be resolved if we achieve a better distribution of developmental opportunities with northern countries doing more to cut down emissions and giving that emission space to developing countries but by the same token we can't allow particularly large populous developing countries to embark on the same kind of developmental path that the West has charted already, that would push us all over the boundaries of a safe uh, kind of space for, for uh, carbon emissions. That would exhaust our remaining carbon budget. And therefore, we need to find some compromise that tries to meet both of these objectives. Thank you. And um, there are some more questions, but uh, we've reached the end of our time. So I'm going to leave it there. We could take those um, offline. And I should flag that um, there's a public online event launch for this book on the 3rd of March, uh, which you can sign up to on the LSE events website. Um, so you can go and ask Robert some more questions there. But thank you very much for speaking today, Robert. I really appreciate Great. it. Thank you. And there'll be some of the contributors to the book on that panel discussion.